Grace, how we doing? Yeah. Let's go. You guys ready to jump into God's word this morning? Yeah. Just a little bit? No, just a lot of it. Come on now. Let's go. Let's go. Well, hey, good morning. Good morning. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here and uh, pumped that you're with us, whether you're in the room or online. We are thankful that you're part of what God is doing here in Tempe and beyond. And uh, you're in for a treat today because uh, I get to kick us off with a brand new series called Clear Sky. And uh, this this series is uh, talking about a couple different things, but uh, we're really asking the question, what do you see? And we're not asking necessarily what do you see, we're asking that of, of some of the, the different people you'll be hearing from throughout the next few weeks. Uh, we're, we're talking about what do they see when it comes to opportunities for hope. You see, because uh, I, I don't know about you, but, but sometimes we, we wrestle with hope. And despite our, our season and circumstance of life, hope sometimes seems to be on the fringe. And so our, our hope in this series is to actually inspire and invigorate hope within you based off of some different topical things that we're, we're seeing. And, and to think about uh, the start of this series, I was like wrestling with what could we possibly start with? You see, because there's all kinds of things that I see. I don't know about you, but there's all kinds of things in Scripture I see. I, I see a ton of things in culture and in my community and in my families and friendships. I see all kinds of stuff that we can inspire hope in. But I, I wanted to kind of kick us off with, with something that, one, we all have in common. No matter your season, no matter your, your life circumstances, no matter even your walk with Jesus or it maybe you're asking questions, we're so glad you're here. This is for you as well. You see, because we all have this one thing in common and that is we have the power to control our minds. We have the power to control our minds. How many know that in this world right now, there are a number of different things that are vying for control? They are, they are desiring for control over our hearts, over our minds, over our attention, over our attitudes, over our perspectives about this or that, right? There, there's all of these pieces, but you and I, whether you realize it or not, have the power to control our minds. And so we're going to lean into that this morning uh, because there I need you to know that there is power in living out a renewed mind. And so that's where we're going to go this morning because I believe that if we can live out of a renewed mind, then what we'll see is people experiencing freedom and breakthrough. It doesn't matter what's in your life. People will be seeing freedom and breakthrough. And so I don't know about you, but I want freedom and breakthrough throughout my life, throughout the spheres that I'm entrusted. And so that's going to come from somewhere. And I believe that's a power of a renewed mind. So let's do this. Would you pray with me real quick? We'll invite the Holy Spirit to be with us this morning. Hey, Lord, we just thank you for this morning and for the joy and honor of getting to bring you praise. And Lord, we, we, we ask that uh, as we continue to give you our worship this morning, that you would dwell within uh, this space. Lord, would you rest upon each of us? Lord, would you speak to us? You have a specific thing for each and every single one of us. And so, Lord, we invite you to speak to us because the truth is this, Lord, right now your servants are listening. So, Lord, we invite you to do what you want to do in this time, and we will give you your glory. And we said, amen. So here's a question to kind of kick us off. This question I want you to ponder because uh, by the time we get to the end of this morning, uh, I believe it will come full circle for you. And this question, I think, is, is, is integral, and it's a good uh, a tool to then keep checking in on yourself or maybe your spouse or somebody in your friend, friend group or family. Uh, if you want to use this, feel free, steal it. You can have it. Uh, but here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with it right now and practice it. Because the, if somebody were to ask you, hey, what is your life right now? If you were to describe your life using only the imagery of weather, how would you describe your life? What language would you use? What imagery would you use? For some, you might go, oh, it's bright skies up in here. It, for others, it's the complete opposite, and you go, it's dark and gloomy. 
For some, you might be going, it's, hey, you know what, it's a brisk morning and there's dew on the lawn. And uh, if you're uh, in a unique space, you have fog rolling in, right? The, the, these are different types of weather. But some of us, we might go, Josh, I'm standing in the middle of a tornado. I'm in the middle of a storm. I'm in the middle of seeing a giant haboob coming and I have no idea how to navigate this thing. Maybe, maybe you have uh, cloudy skies, and maybe it's cloudy with a chance of, uh, of rain. Maybe it's cloudy with a chance of meatballs. I don't know what your role is, but, but what is the weather of your life? Because if you can pinpoint a little bit what the weather of your life is, it will give you an insight to what's going on inside your heart and mind. You see, in our culture today right now, the weather of many people's lives it looks pretty gloomy. It's pretty heavy. And I'm going to give you a few stats because picturing some of this stuff and then now thinking of weather in the spheres of influence that we're entrusted to, it might open up some of our eyes. And some of us, we might even identify with some of these stats right now. And that's okay because... because what you'll find is today we're going to inspire and invigorate hope as we transform minds. Nearly 25% of adults in the U.S. right now suffer from a diagnosable mental illness. By It's projected uh, throughout our lifetime, uh, every, uh, about 50% of the U.S. population will experience some sort of uh, mental health something. Whether that's an illness or a disease or, or they'll be affected and impacted by some sort of something in mental health. Half of the U.S., 18 to 35 years old, express anxiety over important decisions and were afraid to fail. By the way, all these stats are as of 2020, so they're fairly recent. Over 3 in 10 of that same population said that they felt sad or depressed, with 34% saying that they often felt lonely and isolated from others. Lack of community. 60 to 80 percent of adult males and 40 to 50 percent of adult females regularly use pornography. 24 percent of the U.S., not just adults, which is uh, sobering a little bit, meet the cr criteria for an alcohol use disorder. 130 people per day commit suicide in the U.S. That translates, y'all, to one every 11 minutes, which... Uh, Time over time, since 1999, that's an increase by 35%. Something's going on. One in six couples will struggle with infertility right now. One in six will also miscarry. And many of those couples that are navigating and, and uh, working through those very real and tangible losses, they, some of them never really have the space to grieve and to adequately work through those losses. 40% of marriages actively are being ended in divorce. 24 people per minute, per minute, are victims of some sort of domestic violence, most often by an intimate partner. And of those cases, of those 24 per minute, 22%, that's roughly five or six per minute, are experienced by children. Children are the witnesses of that domestic abuse. This series and this message is not all about mental health, but it's pretty safe to say that there are some very significant matters in this world and in our lives that impacts our hearts, our minds, the weather of our lives, the weather of our community, the weather of our neighborhoods, all of these pieces come together. And they need hope. And I want to tell you this, that this, this morning, our goal, my goal, is to inspire hope where things feel hopeless. In the places that feel heavy. In the places that hurt and are feel, feel painful. Why? Because Jesus still compels us to bring good news. Jesus still compels us to bind the brokenhearted and to embrace them. Jesus still compels us to free those in captivity and, and to break the veil of darkness where darkness so entangles. That's the good news of the gospel is that we get to do that. Why? Because we have a king who's risen. 
Now, this isn't anything new. This news isn't new. Because in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus, just before he goes to the cross, he's with his disciples. And, and he, he was talking with them and empowering them, but encouraging them, too, of what is to come. And he tells them this. He says that in me you may have peace, but in the world you will have trouble. Other versions use tribulation. And, and, and it's not that you might have trouble, not that you, you, you could if, or, or you might not if you play your cards right. He's saying that you will. It, like it's a promise. And it might not be a promise that you want. It's a, not a promise that I necessarily want. I don't want trouble. But I, I, want, I want to live easy. I want to live comfortably. I want to live free. But, but Jesus promises that you will have trouble. But, now this is the biggest but. Like God loves big buts and he cannot lie, you know. Uh, but this is the but. He says, take heart for I have overcome the world. Take heart for I have overcome the world. This world promises you trouble, but take heart because I've overcome it. And by the way, he said before you will have trouble, he said that in me you will have peace. So we take heart because we have peace in Christ. The trouble of this world pales in comparison to the confidence that we have in Christ Jesus. So there's two very real dichotomies at play here that are also at war for your heart and mind. You see, in Christ there's peace, but in this world there's trouble. And in ourselves we have nothing, but in everything we have Christ. Christ has everything. And so that's the position that we, we get to take, that we, we want to take, that we need to take, that in, because I'm in Christ, I can overcome whatever the world throws at me. But how do we actually live that out? Because I don't know about you, but sometimes that's really hard to do. Like that, that's really tough. Because the truth of this matter is this, that every believer is either an overcomer or they're overcome. We're either an overcomer or we're overcome. And we were born into a fight, but we're also born for a fight. We were born into a fight, but we were also born for a fight. The world wants to overcome us. The enemy wants to use everything in the world to, to help overcome us. Neither of them want us to live differently. Neither of them want us to live as overcomers. But here's what I want you to know. When Jesus says take heart in John 16, this is what he's saying. He's saying be courageous, be of good cheer. And, and what's great is that this particular passage, this particular version of take heart, Jesus is actually the only one in scripture that, that's noted to use this particular phrase this particular way. For instance, he says in the healing of the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Walking on water to the disciples who, they're in the middle of a storm and they're about to get capsized and Jesus walks up to them. They think he's a ghost and he goes, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Healing the blind Bartimaeus, he says, take heart, get up, he's calling you. Paul before the council in Jerusalem, getting ready to go to the council of Rome. Uh, Jesus confronts him and he says, take courage. There's a pattern here. That Jesus is actually encouraging his disciples. He's encouraging us today. That we get to then take heart to grasp onto courage and to be an overcomer in the fight that we, they, but we also were not only born into, but that we were born for. The good news of Jesus is that because of his victory and death and our union with him, Right? There, there's a, there's a, a clarify here. It's our union with him. You don't have victory with Christ if you don't have union with Christ. If you don't have an identity in Christ, you don't have victory with Christ because you're not under the blood of Christ. But when the good news of Jesus is this, that when he has the victory over death, which he's already overcome, and we have union with him, then we also have victory over death, the darkness, the difficulty, the desolation. Let me prove it to you in Romans 8, 37. Paul says this, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That, that phrase, more than conquerors, is this uh, word hypernukomen. And it means to keep on being conquerors to greater and greater degrees. It means to, to keep on winning a glorious victory despite your circumstances. Despite how you feel. 
You are a victor in Christ Jesus. And so you get to step into that. And when you take heart, when you take courage, what you're doing is you're, you keep marching forward as a victor. But what is the victory against? Well, Paul lays it out in the next two verses, verses 38 and 39. He says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Come on. The truth is that we were born into a fight, but we were born for a fight. And the fight is not against flesh and blood, but it's against these very things. And you and I in Christ have a victory over those things. We are overcomers over those things. But I need you to know that this battle that wages on, it's been waging for eternity. But it's for your heart and mine. It's for your heart and mine. And I need you to also know that God doesn't withhold us the difficulties of life. Instead, he uses the difficulties of life sometimes to, to get a hold of us, to draw us close, to grow us, to, to help us be the, the man, the woman, the child that he's called us to be confident in him. My message this morning isn't here to preach people happy, it's to preach people free. I don't want you just to be happy. I want you to be free. You see, there's a huge difference between happiness and freedom. There are plenty of people who are, who are uh, quote unquote, happy, but they're not free. They're, they're happy, but they're not satisfied. Life isn't great. Things are all over the map. Feels like somebody threw a grenade into life and they're happy in some things, but they're not in others. Happiness is not a fruit of the Spirit, but joy is. Freedom comes from Christ. It's by truth that we are set free. So I need you to know that the foundation to the life that we live, despite our circumstances, despite our happiness, informs how we live, and it should impact how we view our life, the outlook that we have in our life. More often than not, the thing that holds us back, that keeps us trapped, that keeps us stuck, is our own minds. Maybe that's you this morning. You're trapped up here. You think everything's good. You can walk into the space like this. You're, you're, you're free by what we can see. But what's really happening in here is that you are stuck beyond belief. You don't know how to get out of the shackles. You don't know how to get out of that prison. You don't know how to move past those thoughts, those ideas, those things that so entangle and encumber you. You see, we move in the direction of our strongest thoughts. And I'm not just talking about general thoughts. I'm talking about our intrusive thoughts, right? I'm, I'm talking about the narratives that we tell ourselves. Y'all, we, we, we tell ourselves narratives. We tell ourselves things all day long. I don't know about you, but I, I'll admit to this because it seems to happen to me more often than not. But especially when I'm driving, I seem to always get cut off. It's like an, a daily occurrence. And it seems like uh, my, my intrusive thought, my intrusive narrative is that sometimes I just want to I wish that my truck wasn't, wasn't in good shape and that I had a beater and I could just floor the gas. It's an intrusive thought. I would hope that I'd never do that, but... Or would I? No, I wouldn't. But that's the thoughts we have to wrestle with. We have to wrestle with these things. Maybe you have mental triggers that that you associate with certain ideas or certain people or certain experiences in life. Anxieties and fears, they, they rule you. I just need you to know that if these things are ruling you, you're in trouble. Because it means that the peace of God does not rule your heart. You have something else on that throne. If you're taking notes this morning, I highly encourage you to. There's, there's a QR code up on the screen where you can scan in and, and get the notes and uh, interact with those two. Um, but here's the big idea I want you to know. This, this is what we're gunning for. Is that you can't transform your life, but you can change your mind. 
You can't transform your life, but you can change your mind. And if you'll change your mind, God will transform your life. So what is this transformed mind? Romans 12, 2. Paul tells us to do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the what? The renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to do some stuff. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and and perfect will. That's what happens when we're transformed, when we reject the world, when we reject the patterns of this world, and and we adopt this, this transformation God has for us by renewing our minds, which, again, you and I have the power to control. You want to know what God's will is for your life? Well, it's going to start in your mind. Yes, hit scripture, please. But it's going to start in your mind. You're going to have to make a commitment at some point to do something differently, to see something differently than what you've seen before. Just removing yourself and your family and people that you love from the world, just so that they're not tempted or to conform by it, isn't the answer. In fact, I'd propose that it's the direct opposite. I would propose to you that not only does it minimize your witness, but it exercises your fears, and it doesn't serve the king or his kingdom. We have a king who is victorious. And the scoreboard, in case you're, 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 you're checking or you're tracking, the, the scoreboard right now is everything to the enemy's nothing. That's the scoreboard. And so we can take confidence and we can take heart and we can find courage in that because this, the, the, the scales are completely unbalanced for the better. What kind of conquerors are we if we have no heart to be courageous with? What kind of conqueror does that make us? It says to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Because then only then will we be able to test and approve In other words, only then and then will we be able to to discern the spirit of this world and the spirit of this age versus the kingdom of God. Only then will we be able to discern the Holy Spirit from the spirit of this age. And and so we, we have to work with this. We have to grasp this, otherwise we miss it. But there's an outlook of a transformed life. And I want to show you what that transformed life looks like because uh, Paul in Ephesians 4, Paul, Paul, by the way, was just a baddie for the Lord, right? Paul Paul was after these churches time and time again, and and he was was harping the same thing over and over, but he said it and packaged it in in different ways. And and he's saying similar stuff to the church in Ephesus in uh, Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. He says this, on the outlook of a transformed life that you were taught with regard to your former way of life. In other words, he's recognizing that they came from something. They came from a, a one way of living, but then something happened, and then they were taught differently. And, and as a result, uh, by the way, this is, this is discipleship in, in action, right? When we work with, with individuals or your family or people on the street, I don't know who is God entrusting you to to walk with in the daily uh, habits of life to discern their old life from the new life that they can have in Christ Jesus? That's discipleship. And so he's saying you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off the old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You see, when we take on the new self, we are not simply changing our minds. We are actually redefining our citizenship as a child of God. And we're aligning with the kingdom of God as a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And the old is gone and the new is come. Friends, you can't transform your life, but you can change your mind. And if you'll change your mind, God will transform your life. The truth of the matter is the biggest prison in this world isn't in a physical location. It's in our minds. And we have to be willing to start there. I would propose that some of us, we are so stuck in our minds. And we'll stay there until we make a change. 
We have to commit to the change, though, first. Nobody can take that step for you. Nobody's breaking you out. But if you'll make a commitment to change, God will transform your life. As I was preparing uh, this, this week and thinking about y'all uh, this weekend, I just felt like somebody needs to hear this today. That what God says about you is far more important than what the enemy, the world, your friends, your family, even yourself says about you. What God thinks is got to be the greatest thoughts that you think. Nothing matters more than what God thinks of you. If you want to see transformation in your life, it starts in your mind. Because your mind is a house for all your ideologies, philosophies, reasonings, thought patterns, and worldviews by which we live. It, it is also the stuff that shapes behavior pattern, defense mechanisms, the systems which adversity and tragedy are handled. They, it's also shaped by our friends and our families and the circumstances of life. And, and, and they're going to continue to be shaped by our experiences and our educations and, and the ongoing circumstances and challenges of life. That's true. But if we are to start with our minds, we have to be willing to ask hard questions. We have to be willing to ask questions like, what are the thoughts that I think about? How, how many times do you think about the things that you're thinking about? Very rarely do we ever, right? We just operate. At least I do. Sometimes that's a detriment. Sometimes that's a, that's a gift. I need to think about the things that I'm thinking about. We have to ask things like, uh, of the things that I, I ponder throughout today, what am I holding on to the most? What are the internal dialogues that I'm telling myself? When something bothers me or triggers me, how do I act? How do I respond? We have to ask things like, how does the truth of God's word impact how I actually live my life? Right? We have to be, be able to ask these things. What, what about this thought? If somebody were to watch your life, what kind of weather would they describe about your life? And would the weather dictate how you live? Ideally, the weather doesn't change because you're, you're strong and steady in a storm. But what does the weather of your life tell other people about what you think and what you believe about who God says he is and who he's created you to be? Behavior modification is not actual transformation. It's actually a symptom to the problem. It's a symptom to the problem. And if we only ever deal with the symptoms and we never deal with the roots, eventually the things that entangle will kill Guaranteed. The outlook of a transformed mind puts off the old self and is made new in the attitude of our minds so that we can then put on the new self created to be like God. Colossians 3 gives us the attitude of a transformed mind. This is the attitude. If you want, if you want something to go, hey, where, where am I at with this thing? What, what's my attitude lie? This is a great place to start. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 Paul says, if you have then been raised with Christ, seek things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, and set your mind on those things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For to be transformed by the renewing of our minds and the attitude of our minds has to be in line with things that are above. If there's anything else in that picture... If there, there's anything else other than things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, then it's under the influence of a lie. We have to come into submission with that. Otherwise, we miss the opportunity to be fully transformed into the image and the likeness of Christ. You see, I, the past couple years, I, I've had this, this challenge that I've been navigating and I'm not really telling much about uh, much of anybody about it, just because there's so many more questions than answers. But the past couple years, I, I've been navigating this, this health journey of trying to navigate, uh, one, a couple concerns, right? Uh, an underactive thyroid, uh, uh, some, some concerns with, with weight, and, and some concerns with uh, even my sleep patterns, and, and getting an average of five, maybe six hours of sleep, and that being like the best, um, and and that, that's been impacting my health over the past couple of years. And so naturally I've had questions and go to see doctors and, and talk about, hey, what's going on? How do I address this? What is a holistic solution to this kind of thing? 
And more often than not, what I would find in my own personal journey is that uh, my doctors more often than not would want to prescribe me a medication. Or, or they would want to prescribe me some, some device, something uh, uh, of the next new technological device. And now I'm not knocking those things. Uh, I, I, in fact, I, I have a healthcare administration degree. And so I, I, I value healthcare and I value the science and, and what God allows in, in some of the healthcare field to happen to heal and, and help people. But in my own personal journey, I just felt like the solutions that were being provided weren't the solutions. And, and so I, I kind of started exploring. And uh, one, one thing that I, I did do this, this past uh, year and a half was I, I tried to, to fix some of my, my diet and my eating habits. I would eat small meals. I'd eat larger meals. I would fast. I would do some of this, this stuff. And, and I wasn't seeing some of the change in results that I, I was hoping to see. My issues were still prevalent. And so... But when I met with the doctors, I felt like there was another solution that I wasn't being told. And I'm not knocking my doctors at all, but I'm just saying that for me, I felt like there was another thing. And the thing that I ultimately settled on was the thing that I swore against. And it was going and experiencing some kind of health diet plan. And I, I was so against dieting. I was so against some of this stuff. I, I didn't see the value of it. And my mind was locked up with this idea that I can't do that. I, that's not for me. I, I don't like the idea. I'm not going to just pump shakes all the time. I'm like, I'm not going to do that, right? And, and, but what happened was I started seeing results with people that I love. I, I started seeing uh, impact happen with, with people that, that were wrestling with some of the same things I was. And what I discovered is when I gave it a chance... And, and, and I'm not here for glory. I'm not here for any of that. But what I found is that in six to eight weeks, I, I lost 20 pounds. And, and what happened in that is that I, I regained some of my health. So some of my thyroid was off the charts crazy, but now it's, it's well below the manageable level. Like it's healthier than healthy. Right? I regained some of my sleep. I regained some of this stuff. And I, I feel more energetic and lifelike but I had to start with the hiccups in my mind. I was, I was locked up. And I'm so grateful that I made a decision to do something different, to do something outside of what I might normally do, outside of my own control. And it quite literally changed a lot. But here's the point, is that I figured that if, if that's the case for me in the physical how much more is that the case for me or us in the spiritual? How much more do we wrestle with that? What's it for you this morning? What is the thing that's holding you back, that, that, that's keeping you locked up? What are the mindsets, the habits, the attitudes, the ideas that, that you are, are so entangled by that you, you want freedom, you think about freedom in it, but you don't take that step? Well, I want to help some of us this morning because um, I, I have eight different signs of a transformed mind. And, and these eight signs, I, I'm going to encourage you this week to, to jot these down. They're in the notes. They're in the sermon questions as a PDF. Uh, the, I think the QR code is going to be on the screen. Grab these notes and then print them or hang them up somewhere. Make them accessible. That way you can look at them, but choose one this week. Don't, don't commit to try to do all of them because you'll, you'll not get anywhere. Choose one and commit to the Holy Spirit this week. Help me work this out because I don't see this in my life or this sign isn't prevalent in my life. And so therefore, Lord, I want to work this out with you because I want to see freedom and breakthrough in my life this week. Okay? So giddy up. Here we go. Uh, these are eight quick signs for a transformed Mind. Number one, the sign of a transformed mind is that you live in hope. Any thought that comes across your mind that doesn't inspire or produce hope is under the influence of a lie. The litmus test for truth is God's word. So anything that isn't founded in God's word, that isn't built on God's word, uh, it, it doesn't produce hope, it's under the influence of a lie. So let that be a filter for your mind. And maybe we have filters that we've adapted on our mind that we need to release. We need to uh, obtain this filter of what does it look like to live in hope? What are the lies that I'm choosing to believe? 
Number two, a sign of a transformed mind is that you live in harmony with and peace with others. You live in harmony and peace with others. Romans 12, 16 to 18 says this. To, Paul urges us to live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with the people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. And if possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Some of us, that's our biggest contention. Is people. So what would it look like to adopt a level of harmony and peace in your life? Number three, sign of a transformed mind is that your inner dialogue is positive and operates with that outlook. You see, because the narrative that we tell ourselves impacts the life that we live. A sound mind is a sober mind. A sound mind is a sober mind, and it demonstrates in our, in our lives and to the world around us that, that it's congruent with our, our, our values, our standards. Not that we're just running aimlessly, that we have a purpose. Timothy tells us that God has given us a spirit not of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. In psychology, there's this concept called psychological flexibility. And it's defined as the ability to respond to obstacles successfully and in a way that's congruent with those values and standards. Kingdom values, kingdom standards. In other words, psychological flexibility is the concept of finding solution despite our circumstances, despite the cloudy with a chance of meatballs, right? And, and it allows us to move forward despite those things, even when the circumstances are hard. In other words, it's a scientific way of describing this spiritual reality of letting the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Are you known for that? Are you known for somebody who operates out of peace? Is your inner dialogues and inner workings and inner operations, are they driven by peace or are they not? Number four, the sign of a transformed mind. That you like yourself and you are confident in who you are. You see, our self-esteem uh, is how much we, we like and respect ourselves. Our self-esteem flows from what we actually believe about ourselves, which then reflects what we think of God and what we believe about God and how he's made us, wired us, and positioned us. So likewise, if we are not confident in our identity in Christ, we're going to struggle to live out an identity in Christ. Right? There, there's a, there's a, a confidence that we have in who Christ says he is and who Christ says we are. Number five, the sign of a transformed mind is that you live out of what is true, not just what feels true. You live out what is true, not just what feels true. Because what you know trumps how you feel. And therefore, we're going to struggle to renew our minds if, if we allow what we know to be dictated solely by how we feel. You see, our feelings are our great servants, but they're terrible masters. They're, they're great servants, but terrible masters. And so in order to know what we know, we need to define what is true. And, and luckily in Philippians, we have a, an idea of, of how to discern some of that. He says that finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. You want to know what's true? Think about the things that are above, like this stuff. This isn't the art of positive thinking, or this isn't you know, some form of spiritual manifestation. This is actually alignment with heaven. This is alignment with heaven, and our minds will remain a mess until we start thinking God thoughts here on earth as it is in heaven. Number six, the sign of a transformed mind is that your life is characterized by joy. Your life is characterized by joy. Are you known for your joy? Are you known for your joy? Or do people just see, see this, this, this kind of bundle of something that's walking and moving through the world? No, we, we are the light of this world. A city upon a hill cannot be, be hidden. Right? You and I should be known for our joy. Because the it says in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. In other words, a heart that is yielded to God lives for an audience of one, and the hope of Jesus for you characterizes your life when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Are you known for your joy? Number seven, 
and sign of a transformed mind is that you are quick to forgive, extending grace and mercy to others. Some of us, this is a big challenge point that we can't forgive. We can't forget either. We're stuck there. But forgiveness doesn't mean that we forget. But it does mean that we release ourselves from the bondage that the past and the plausibilities of the what-ifs hold us to. It's been said that forgiveness is a gift that allows ourselves to let go and to move on. When we extend mercy to others, what happens is they don't get what they do deserve. When we extend grace to others, they, they get what they don't deserve. And it messes them up. It's awesome. You have the power to live like that. Forgiveness also, I need to be clear, doesn't require a reconnection or a rebuilding of relationship other, either. But it does free us of the burden that unforgiveness will cause. And number eight, the sign of a transformed mind is that you live like a victor and not like a victim. You live like a victor and not like a victim. Y'all, there is a fight for our souls. And more often than not, the battle is won or lost in our minds. I need you to remember that he who is in us is greater than he who is in this world. Amen? Amen. And because of that, therefore, in Christ, we have the power against the enemy to demolish strongholds, to demolish arguments, to demolish every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God by taking captive, how? Every thought. That is the power of a transformed mind. When we put this into submission, do not conform to the patterns of this world, Paul says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then and only then will you be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You can't transform your life, but you can change your mind. And if you'll change your mind, God will transform your life. This morning, I don't know what you come in the doors with. I don't know what, what you need transformation in. I don't know what you're wrestling with. Do I want change or do I not? I don't know where you need freedom and breakthrough. I don't know what chains are holding you back in your head or in your heart. But I do know that there, there are eight ways that we can practice this right now. In fact, I'm going to ask you right now. I didn't do this in first service, but I want to ask you this right now because I feel like it's, it's, it's timely. I want you to close your eyes real quick. And I just want you to ask the Lord, Lord, what is the one area that I need to work in this week with you? What is the one area that I need to work with you on this week? What if the process for freedom and breakthrough can start right now? What if partnering with somebody today can help bring alignment and address the things that are holding you back? I'm going to go ahead and invite our prayer partners to come on up. We want to pray with you this morning. That thing that you're thinking about that's holding you, I want, I want to encourage you to, to release that this morning. Come pray with somebody. We're here for you. We're not here to just pray for you. We're here to pray with you. There's a difference. But also, I need you to know that there's no such thing as a junior Holy Spirit. We all have access to the same Holy Spirit. And in this room, you are all equipped for the work of the ministry to pray and to engage with people for the hope of Jesus. I'm going to pray for us right now. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this morning and thank you for the, again, the joy and honor of giving you praise. But Lord, we, we know that we can't transform our lives, but we can make a change. We can change our minds. And Lord, through that, you can work with that. You can work with us to transform our lives. So Lord, no matter where my friends are at this morning, whether in the room, online, Lord, they're watching it down the line, Lord, we, we just pray. Lord, that you encounter us in a way that calls out the thing that's holding us back, that's holding us trapped. But let us release this and relinquish this to you so that we might walk in freedom in you. 
no longer as victims, but as victors, confident, where we could take heart and have courage in you. Lord, go before us this week. Help us bring to mind one thing that we need to work through this week with you. Lord, we're here to do the work because we trust you and we know that you love us. So Jesus, go before us. We'll continue to give you your glory. In Jesus' name.